or doing this video to talk about some of the historical debates and doctrinal presentations that uh, Dr. Bernard has done through the years of his ministry. A lot of people are familiar with some of these debates. You may have heard it on a radio broadcast. You may have seen it on YouTube. But a lot of people don't know about the background to some of these debates. So I thought it would be interesting to have you tell some of the story of what happened leading up to these debates, some of the highlights of the debates, some of your perspective. So let's start way back in 1984. Um, you were at Harvard University. So tell us a little bit about how that came about and what you did there. Well, at that time, I was an instructor at Jackson College of Ministries in Jackson, Mississippi. And I received a notice that there was going to be the first occasional symposium on oneness Pentecostalism at Harvard University. So I was interested. There had been really no scholarly presentation, to my knowledge, of oneness Pentecostalism. And thus, I wanted to be part of it. Uh, I responded, submitted a paper proposal. It was accepted. And so I went to Harvard to give that presentation. What I found out is that apparently some former United Pentecostal Church members were at Harvard, uh, particularly one, uh, doing uh, graduate studies. And he wanted to have a forum for some ex-UPCI people to reflect on their theological journey. But he wanted to be funded by... Uh, Harvard and you know secular sources uh, but in order to do that he had to create a, a symposium and uh, give a call for papers um, so I don't think he really envisioned that oneness people would actually want to make presentations but as it turned out uh, we did and also the editor-in-chief of the UPCI JL Hall uh, participated as well and uh, gave a paper or at least a response to a paper and also in attendance was Jesse Williams, the Assistant General Superintendent of the UPCI for the Eastern Zone. And so a number of oneness people showed up. Uh, I gave my paper, which uh, later was published as a booklet, Essentials of Oneness Theology. Uh, some other outside scholars came that were not connected to oneness Pentecostalism at all, but were just interested in Pentecostalism in general and uh, were intrigued by the, the oneness message, or at least... Uh, wanted to study more about oneness. So it turned out to be quite uh, enlightening and interesting uh, study of people connected with the oneness movement, but people interested in the oneness movement. Out of that directly came the idea for the UPCI to have its own symposium. Brother Williams and Brother Hall uh, both saw the need to create space for oneness scholarship so that you wouldn't have to go outside the oneness movement to engage in scholarship. And so as a direct result in 1986, there was the first symposium on oneness Pentecostalism uh, held by the UPCI in St. Louis. And then from there, uh, eventually, this was one of the main factors in leading to Urshan Graduate School of Theology, of which I became the first president. As people begin to see there was a hunger for scholarship within the UPCI, there was a need, there was value. Uh, and so really, indirectly, this symposium Although it was originally intended somewhat, if not hostile to the UPCI, at least an outside look at oneness Pentecostalism. But instead, it became a platform that really encouraged scholarship within the apostolic movement. The next one I want to talk about is in 1989. Uh, this debate, J.L. Hall, David Bernard, uh, Robert Moray, and Edgar Havich, and there were four episodes recorded. Now the title of the show that you were invited to participate in was Exposing the Lie. So it's, it's kind of a hostile environment going in. How did you get invited to go? And tell me some, some about the story there. At that time, I was the associate editor for the UPCI working in St. Louis. Brother Hall, J.L. Hall was the editor in chief. So he was my immediate superior. We worked closely together. Uh, we were contacted by the su district superintendent of Pennsylvania for the UPCI. And he related that a former UPCI minister had been interviewed on this television program as an expose of the UPCI to, to classify us as heretics or a cult. As it turned out, this person had left the UPCI under uh, less than ideal circumstances and he had joined what we might call a charismatic church. But then shortly after, he 
have left that church under uh, difficult circumstances. And so it seemed that his testimony was not credible. And as a result of that, the district superintendent contacted the host of the television program to say, uh, you've really portrayed us unfairly using uh, discredited sources. Would you be willing to set the record straight? And so the host, I think, felt uh, that he should give a more balanced presentation. So two Trinitarians and two Oneness scholars were invited to participate. Of course, the host was Trinitarian, and the whole purpose of his program was to promote what he considered Orthodox Christianity and to label Oneness Pentecostals as outside Orthodoxy. But in fairness, we ask that we not be called a cult, but we be given a fair chance to discuss Scripture. Uh, as it turned out, uh, they didn't officially call us a cult, but they did heavily try to say we weren't Orthodox Christians. And one of the um, debaters on the other side did say at one point, because of our belief in water baptism being part of salvation, well, this is why people call you a cult. I should have been a little more aggressive on air, but I waited till we were off air and said, why did you say that? Because that violates the terms of our agreement. He said, well, I didn't call you a cult. I said, but you use that implication. I said, you know, if you're going to call us a cult, well, the Roman Catholic Church also teaches uh, baptism as part of salvation. So if that makes some, uh, a group a cult, would you be willing to, in the next segment to get back on and say, well, the, the Roman Catholic Church is likewise a cult? Well, the host interrupted our conversation. Wait a minute. This is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 75% uh, of our viewing audience is Catholic. We are not going to call the Roman Catholic Church a cult. Uh, and so uh, I wish I'd had that discussion on air. But anyway, it was set up as an attempt to give the UPCI fair, equal time because the previous presentation had really not been credible and had been distorted as even the Trinitarian host acknowledged. So I do believe we were given an opportunity to explain our, our views. Uh, another part of the agreement is that we agreed that uh, nothing would be edited in any way but the entire presentation would be broadcast. And I, uh, I do think the host fulfilled that. My understanding is one segment, however, was never aired in its entirety. So it wasn't edited. It just never was aired. I can only speculate, but I think the reason for that was at the very end of the second uh, discussion on the oneness of God, uh, the main Trinitarian uh, person uh, thought he had a great explanation. He said, the Trinity is easy to explain. And of course, you can see the exact quotation if you watch it. But he said, it's like Peter, James, and John. Uh, three persons, they're all human. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, but all God. Of course, my response was, well, if that's the case, then you believe in three gods. If Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons, like three people sitting in this room, then anyone can see that regardless of how you explain it, you actually believe in uh, three gods. And he did use the term three separate personalities, which, as I understand, is not Orthodox Trinitarianism. Uh, so if, if he didn't consider us to be Orthodox, well, his explanation of the Trinity would equally be seen as unorthodox, going very far in the direction of tritheism. Subsequently, um, I, I do believe this debate was marketed in various forms in a greatly edited format, which I didn't think was appropriate. Uh, many years later, um, you know, I've still, I still hear about that debate. But if you want to uh, look at it in its entirety, we did get all four segments, both audio and video, as soon as they were produced. So. Uh, it, it is an excellent, I think, a pretty fair representation on both sides of oneness versus Trinity and the doctrine of salvation as well. Another phrase he mentioned during the debate, I could not believe that he said this, but he actually said three centers of consciousness. And I believe it was that at that point I saw you on camera start grabbing your notes and scribbling on there. Yes, I would say many if not most classical trinitarians will say that's a bridge too far we can't really say there are three centers of consciousness in the godhead 
Although some Trinitarians will acknowledge that. And I believe that phrase helps us get beyond the ambiguous term person to say, what are you really thinking about? And it, this illustrates what's interesting to me. If you use the word Trinity, then you can be labeled as an Orthodox Christian no matter what you believe. And so if I would say, well, I believe in a Trinity of manifestations, I could probably be accepted as a good Trinitarian. He, on the other hand, having a very tritheistic interpretation is accepted. So to me, it shows we've got to go beyond the labels and talk more specifically about what we really believe and compare that to the Word of God. There was a debate that you participated in in 1998 um, with Jonathan Urshan and uh, Jam Dr. Jamal Badawi and Imam Shabir Ali. And the topic was, who was Jesus in the Bible and the Quran? How did you decide to participate in that one? And what's your perspective on how that has affected things? There was a United Pentecostal pastor in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, uh, and a member of his church who had some interactions with Muslims in the community. And this led to a discussion a dialogue and a desire to bring in guest speakers who would be scholars. So actually the forum was very peaceful. It wasn't antagonistic. It wasn't a debate in a hostile sense. It was more or less, uh, let's talk about Jesus Christ. What was interesting to me is that the Muslim scholars quoted primarily from liberal Christian theologians who said that Jesus is not really God that the Bible doesn't really teach that Jesus is God, but this is a later development uh, in church history. Of course, they were looking at the development of Trinitarianism, where Jesus becomes the second person of the Trinity. And obviously that is not found in the New Testament. But since we were coming from a oneness perspective, there were two unique features. First of all, we could agree with our Muslim friends that God is essentially one, not three centers of consciousness or three eternal distinction is in, in his nature. So that was a little different for them. Uh, the second thing is, of course, we espouse a very conservative theology. So it's, since we're not dependent on the development of the doctrine of the Trinity over 300 years uh, to prove the deity of Christ, we could just go straight to the New Testament and say, if you look at the New Testament from a conservative perspective, uh, believing uh, exactly what it says and believing it's authentic and not a creation over a hundred or two hundred years, then you will indeed find that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Of course, Muslims do claim to believe in the Bible. They believe the Quran is superior. So we were able to say, well, if you go back to the Bible as written, you'll find that Jesus is more than a man, that he is truly God manifest in the flesh. And of course, ultimately, our distinction between the Bible and the Quran is this. When you, when you follow the teachings of the Bible and seek after God, you can have a miraculous encounter with God by receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, seeing miracles, signs, and wonders, healing, deliverance, uh, restoration of family relationships, uh, a brand new life. Of course, the Muslims don't really claim that for the Quran. So uh, looking at it, not only from a theological point of view, but a practical point of view, I felt we were able to show the Bible is indeed God's Word. If you follow it, you will understand that Jesus truly is God manifest in the flesh, and you will also have a new life. You can be born again and have a brand new life. The next debate I want to talk about was actually a radio debate with James White. It happened in 1999. You debated him again on the radio in yeah. 2003. Um, so just lumping these together in your debates with James White, um, what led to that and uh, what do you think came out of that debate or those debates? Well, James White is a, a well-known uh, apologist for really Calvinism and he seeks debates uh, with people that he believes are unorthodox. Uh, as I recall, I believe in both cases, this was um, a Christian Trinitarian uh, talk show host that contacted me to see if I'd be willing to represent the views of Oneness Pentecostals. So I did agree. However, I think in both cases the format was very limiting because even though I think the host tried to be fair, uh, naturally his tendency was to give time to James White. And if James White made a good point, 
uh, he was happy to leave it there. If I was trying to make an, a, point, a point, sometimes he was ready to go on to a different topic or ready to go on to questions from the audience. So I found myself trying to play catch up because um, the Trinitarian, James White would make this point, I would try to respond, but then both the host and and James White would, would rebut and, and I would find limited time. And also the way certain things were framed. For instance, the debate, debate on tongues, they kept trying to emphasize tongues being necessary for salvation, whereas I wanted to say, wait a minute, what we say is the Holy Spirit is necessary for salvation. We say tongues is the expected initial sign, but we're not trying to put a premium on tongues. So I felt it was very difficult for me to frame what we teach um, the way we actually teach it and the way the Bible teaches it. Uh, but I accepted um, those opportunities because I was being asked um, what oneness people believe, and I felt it was an opportunity uh, to, uh, to get our views in a public forum. Uh, having said that, I don't, I don't really recommend that forum necessarily um, because I believe it, it's, uh, I, I didn't really have a full opportunity to explain what we believe from our perspective. Also, I didn't necessarily have a full opportunity to respond to each question or each point that was made. There's a very famous debate that I want to talk about next. It's in the year 2000. It was a debate you did with Gene Cook. And this one has been on YouTube and ver on various channels for a long time. A lot of people have seen it. And you expressed you've been surprised by people you've encountered in your travels who've seen it. So I'd like you to talk about like you to talk about that a little bit, but also it's an interesting story how that how that happened. So yes, well I was scheduled in the year 2000 to go to San Diego for an apostolic apologetic conference. So this was uh, not a UPCI church, but a large uh, Oneness Pentecostal church that was hosting this conference, and they sent an advertisement to all churches of all denominations in the city of San Diego. Uh, saying this would be an apostolic restoration conference. Well, there was a man named Gene Cook. Apparently, he's uh, some kind of Baptist, and he was somewhat known as a debater. He contacted the apostolic uh, host to say, um, you're, you're, you're inaccurately saying that you have the apostolic doctrine. You're promoting this throughout the city, but actually, you're not apostolic. You don't have the original doctrine, so we challenge you to a debate. And if you don't accept this challenge, then we're going to pick at your conference and, and tell everybody that uh, you don't really have the right doctrine. So when I landed at the airport uh, in San Diego, the pastor asked me, he said, we've been challenged to a debate. Would you be willing to accept the challenge? And I said, well, you've asked me to come teach on apologetics. So you're the host. I'll leave it up to you. If you want me to teach on apologetics at the conference, I'll do that. If you want me to practice apologetics through the form of a debate, I'll do that. And the reason why I mention it is I don't seek debates. Um, although by nature I enjoy that kind of exchange, I consider that I'm a minister of the gospel. So my ministry is preaching and teaching, not debating. And I believe the best way to communicate the gospel is not through a debate format, but through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God where there's anointing of the Holy Spirit where people have an opportunity to respond in faith. So uh, I've been challenged to debate many times, but I, I don't have time for that. And also as the years have gone on, and because of the positions that I've held as president of Urshan Graduate School of Theology, now general superintendent, for someone to debate me, that could tend to elevate their stature. If they're part of a debate organization or they're trying to make a name for themselves as a cult hunter or a heresy hunter, then for them to debate a leading scholar or a leading official elevates their ministry. But it, from my perspective, it doesn't really advance ministry that much. So there's not really that much although uh, to gain by it. Although, sure, I'm open for opportunities to present our views, I would rather do so in an environment where people are seeking God, are receptive to the Holy Spirit, and so forth. So therefore, I've, for many years, I've just had an informal policy. I don't accept debates unless the apostolic leaders of that area 
are inviting me because they feel like it will be helpful in their situation. So, for example, the one we talked about earlier in Pennsylvania, it was an opportunity to set the record straight. The UPCI had already been falsely maligned, and now we were being given equal time. And so the leaders of that area felt this is a positive thing to help redress a wrong. Would you come? So certainly I will. Uh, in this case, there wasn't really a problem, but there was an issue here. Uh, the pastor was trying to promote the apostolic faith throughout the city. He was being challenged. Um, it was stated that he would be opposed, and so he was asking, uh, would you accept this opportunity? So I did. Uh, the other thing is, it depends on the format. In this case, it was well-structured. We were given equal time. Uh, we were given time to cross-question each other. And also the audience was given plenty of time to ask questions. So in that environment, uh, the problem with debates is you have such limited time. Often you can't cover every important point. Often you're not able to respond to strong points of the other side. For example, in the debate, uh, the, the radio debates that I mentioned earlier. But in this forum, there was adequate opportunity for both sides to address every question, every major point, until all minds were clear. And I would uh, say, if you look at the very end, towards the end, there was, a, I think, a clear um, turning point, or at least an opportunity. Probably 75% of the audience was apostolic. So uh, we tried to make sure there weren't excessive demonstrations for either side, because we're trying to have a respectful forum, and, and it was. It wasn't a hostile debate. But we want it to be scholarly, we want it to be restrained, and we want it to be a discussion. So towards the end, uh, a question was raised, and uh, the, uh, Gene Cook made this point about Pentecostals. And even though the debate was supposed to be on the doctrine of God, he did inject towards the end that he felt we were wrong because of our Pentecostal experience, our belief in the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. For him, that was just another point is why our doctrine must be wrong. Uh, and so he made the comment that it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. And he applied that directly to Pentecostals. Well, since three-fourths of the audience was Pentecostal, you could sense an immediate um, negative response from the audience. I mean, they were respectful, but you could see almost people holding their breath or, or saying, wow, did he, did he really say that? Did he just accuse all of us of being wicked and adulterous? So people are gasping and they're shocked that this has been a pretty respectful uh, format, but this is quite an attack. And it's not directly related to the subject at hand. So I responded based on Mark 16, uh, we don't follow signs, signs follow us. Well, that statement just kind of uh, gave a spontaneous release to the audience, and they, they began responding vigorously, which we had to quiet them down. Uh, but that coming towards the end, that seemed to be a victorious moment to say, wait a minute, you're, you're misjudging us, you're mischaracterizing us, and uh, we're actually the ones who are trying to be apostolic here. We're actually trying to follow the Word of God. And, and, and because the debate was, I think because of its format, because it allowed a full discussion of all sides, uh, and because it ended on such a positive note, I think that's why it has been so well known. I think there have been, uh, you know, uh, unofficially people have posted this, not without any permission from either side. And one place, I think there was 300,000 views. And yes, even traveling in overseas in remote countries like Papua New Guinea, of all places, uh, I found many people that were familiar with that particular video. So I guess it strikes a chord, it meets a need. And so we tried to get the best quality um, on our website, the YouTube channel, so that uh, there are many other uh, you know, spinoffs from many other sites, but hopefully this will be the best one. I want to mention a debate that you did with Robert Moray, and again, he was on the one in Pennsylvania we talked about earlier, uh, but you did a radio debate with him on, uh, in 2001 on a St. Louis radio station, 
and you talked about oneness Pentecostal theology. And it's interesting at the beginning, he kind of, he was using the term cult. Uh, and of course, he's called oneness Pentecostals a cult, or specifically the UPCI, I think. And I think it was interesting. You were so uh, kind in the way you responded to that charge, which can be shocking. Um, he kind of, it's kind of funny, it kind of took the wind out of his sails. So the second time he came back on in the debate, if you listen to it, he says, well, you're just as, just a nice guy as you always were. <laughs> so what was the background of that debate? Well, there's a little backstory. Uh, I don't recall uh, how that uh, came about, but again, it was a radio station here in St. Louis. And uh, by this time, we had started Urshan Graduate School of Theology. I was the president. So even though I was pastoring in Austin, Texas, I was commuting every uh, other week to St. Louis. Uh, and so I wanted to accept essentially what was a local program. I felt it could be positive publicity or exposure, even though, as I've mentioned before, the radio interviews tend to be limited, especially when you're dealing with a Trinitarian host. But the backstory on Maury, of course, we'd had that previous debate, and he had tried to slip in that we were a cult without directly calling us a cult, which I felt was really a violation of our rules. Of course, in this situation, now he is saying we're a cult. But I had talked to him at some point, and I said, wait a minute, you're using this language of cult, which has sociological connotations for the average listener, to prejudice them. That's really unfair. And of course, he tried to explain, well, I mean this in a theological sense. I said, yes, but that's an unfair tactic because I understand you're trying to define a cult that doesn't agree with you theologically, but the, the neutral way to do that is say, let's discuss Scripture. Do you, are you, does your doctrine align with the Bible or not? That's a fair and neutral way. Then people can objectively study and make their own decision. But when you throw out the word cult, to the average listener, they don't think, oh, does this align with the Bible or not align with the Bible? They think there's something wrong with this group. Uh, financial control, um, you know, authoritarian tactics, uh, alienating people from their families. And I say, we don't have any of those social characteristics. We're no different than uh, most other conservative Christian organizations. So whether you're talking about Trinitarian Pentecostals or Evangelicals, whether you're talking about Assemblies of God or Baptists, you know, we have forms of church government that are very similar to all of those churches. And so it's really not fair to use such a prejudicial label because what it does, it's really betraying a weakness on your part because you're not really wanting to invite theological discussion. You're wanting to use a label that will prejudice people so they won't think of the theology. Whereas if you really felt confident in your own position, you would not want to use tactics like that to obscure the real issues. You would try to invite the real issues. And so he did respond to me off air at one point. He said, well, there are cults with a big C and cults with a little C, with the implication that you know, the big C are the sociological cults. The little C are those that don't agree with his doctrine. So anyway, uh, he did concede that point, that we're not a cult with a big C. Okay. Well, that's good. That's something at least. Yes. Um, all right. Now, there's another one. We don't actually have this one on the channel, but I thought it would be interesting to mention on the video um, as we're talking about the history. And that is MSNBC did a documentary on Pentecostals. It was called Pentecostals Moving Millions in 2002. And you were interviewed on that broadcast. Jerry Jones was interviewed on that broadcast. Scotty Teets was interviewed. I don't know who else may have been interviewed, but it was impacting at the time and it actually got attention within the larger Pentecostal movement. So what's your perspective on, on that? Yes, uh, this in, it was a special of MSNBC and it ran a number of times. I don't remember now how many, even several years later, it, it ran again. And uh, MSNBC, I think, didn't really have an agenda. They were trying to investigate what had become a very popular movement, the Pentecostal movement. So they interviewed all kinds of Pentecostals and Charismatics. And we, as the United Pentecostal Church, we were one of them. Uh, I was interviewed because I was president of Urshan Graduate School of Theology. They, they approached us, they came to our general conference, uh, but our uh, leader at that time was uh, Nathaniel Urshan, our general superintendent. So he wanted me to represent the theological side. 
then Brother Jones was the general secretary, uh, but I think he was preaching at that conference. So they actually had some footage of him preaching, and so they wanted to interview him because he was featured. Um, and then I think Scotty Teets was interviewed as being our leader in New York City, had a very multicultural, diverse church, and would be seen as cutting edge in a major metropolitan area. But I think what happened is we became, the UPCI specifically, became the main example of classical Pentecostals. Even though there are larger groups such as the Assemblies of God and Church of God who would be seen as classical Pentecostals. But it appears to me that when they interviewed everybody, we stood out because our style of preaching, uh, our multiracial conference, our teachings of holiness, our conservative, modest dress, that made us unique and distinctive. And some of the others they interviewed were charismatic preachers, uh, people on the spectrum of the prosperity gospel, name it and claim it. And so their, their mannerisms, their theology, the way they preached was very different from us. And so we seem to be, at least it appears to me to the secular producers of MSNBC, there, we were a, a very distinct group. And so they were trying to make a distinction between the classical Pentecostals and the charismatics, the prosperity preachers. And so we became the best example of how they're, they're different types of Pentecostals. Also, another thing, I don't remember the details, but um, the producer, one of the employees, I believe, got very sick at the conference. We prayed for them, and they were uh, instantly healed. And so even though that did not enter into the production, I think that made an indelible impression upon uh, the people who were doing the show, and that was a, made perhaps another reason why uh, they felt drawn to us. So, so what was very interesting... At the Society for Pentecostal Studies, they showed uh, this special from MSNBC. And some of the discussion was, well, why did the UPCI become, uh, you know, the exemplar of classical Pentecostals? Because actually they're oneness, they're not Trinitarian, they're not mainstream. So there was a little interesting debate of how the UPCI got picked out of all these other groups to be the supreme example of classical Pentecostals. Of course, I felt that was a good choice because I do believe, considering our theology from the first century, we are the original classical Pentecostals. Absolutely, I think there's even a song that was written on yes. that. So um, I wanna talk about another debate. Many people may not have heard of this one and we don't have the video, but we do have the audio and it's on the channel. And this is a debate you did at Lake Michigan College in the Mendel Center in Michigan uh, back in 2005, and you, you debated with Eugene Carpenter. And this was probably one of the more academic, structured debates, and, it's, and everyone had time. And so it's a very, very interesting discussion about oneness and Trinitarian views. Talk, maybe you could talk about that debate. I really like this debate. and. Uh, the sad thing about it, it, it was videoed, but the video technology didn't work. So all that we have is the audio. Otherwise, I think it would be a lot more prominent. I think it deserves a lot more attention. The reason I say that is, as you mentioned, it was a fair discussion. So neither side had an agenda. The format was fair so that everybody's views could be thoroughly considered, objectively considered. And I would say that both Eugene Carpenter, he, he was a professor at a Christian college, and I were equal in our academic background or training, so um, it wasn't um, maybe lopsided or unfair in any way, uh, it was, and it wasn't primarily polemical. In fact, we discussed that we w wouldn't really call this a debate, but it was a doctrinal forum. It was a discussion. It was structured as such. The background is, one of our UPCI church members was attending the college and the subject of oneness came up and uh, the oneness views were not represented very well at all. They were represented as heretical and, and it was a very poor presentation. And so the student felt he was being singled out, marginalized, and it wasn't an accurate portrayal at all. So he went to his professor and said, would you be willing, you know, you, th this is mischaracterized, this is false. 
Um, and, and all these people are getting a false impression of what we believe. So would you be open to something? And so in a process of discussion and negotiation, uh, what was potentially a very negative thing where this Christian college was attacking the UPCI student, it turned around and they brought in Dr. Carpenter, who I believe was a professor from another college, uh, from a seminary perhaps, uh, and they brought me in as from Urson Graduate School of Theology, uh, and we had this discussion, and, and I think it turned out well. Okay, I want to, I don't know if you want to talk about your first sermon at General Conference or not that we put on the channel. I can. There may be some other sermons. Uh, you mentioned that wasn't the first time you preached at a national Oneness Pentecostal yes. conference. Yes, the, the very first time that I preached at a national conference for Oneness Pentecostals was for the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Uh, I suppose they knew me because of my books, and of course, uh, most of my ministry is within the UPCI, but every year for many years I've been given invitations to speak at other oneness groups, other settings, uh, and I always check with the uh, local UPCI superintendent to make sure they're good relationships, and if it seems to be suitable, then sometimes uh, I accept a few of those. So I was asked to speak in New Orleans for the uh, convention of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, several years before I was ever asked to speak at our own UPCI General Conference. So I think that's interesting. Uh, but the first time I was asked to speak for the UPCI was what was then called Whole Missions. It's now called North American Missions. I was asked to be the speaker for the evening uh, North American Mission service. And I think that was primarily based on the fact that we'd started a church in Austin, Texas um, and built it up to a large church with a number of daughter works and then, of course, starting the South Texas District. Uh, I was first a presbyter under the Texas District, uh, and in the seven years that I was presbyter, we grew from 30 churches and zero daughter works to 53 churches and daughter works, most of the daughter works coming out of our church. And then when I became the uh, first superintendent of the South Texas District, we adopted that same model. We had 150 churches and 10 daughter works, I think seven of those daughter works for, were out of our church. And in 15 years, the district has more than doubled. In the seven years of my superintendency, I think we went from 160, uh, I believe it was to 242 churches and daughter works. Uh, so that was in the middle of my superintendency. So I think I was asked because of my track record of starting a church, growing a church, starting the daughter works, and then helping to grow the section and the district. And that's what uh, North American Missions wanted to highlight, and so I was invited to preach. Uh, one part of my message, I felt it was very important to speak against racial prejudice and preach for a multicultural, multiracial revival and, and church growth. And I felt very um, strongly that that needed to be said. To my knowledge, I'd never heard that kind of statement made so definitely uh, from a general conference platform, although of course, obviously, uh, that's what we believe. We stand against all form of racism and for racial inclusion, but I felt as important, if I was gonna have that opportunity, that was one of the things I needed to say. And of course, my main message was on revival, growth. We can have revival, we can grow. Uh, it's the will of God. Um, and I felt that was an important component of the revival that God is giving us in these last days. All right, there is a debate that you did in 2008, and I think many people have never seen this debate until we posted it on this, this YouTube channel. Uh, it's a debate you did with a television station in Jamaica with the host Ian Boyne. And uh, this is an interesting debate. He was very invested in his own theology, and you can, that comes through. But what was your perspective on that debate? Well, I enjoyed it, and, and it wasn't really styled as a debate. I was ministering in Jamaica for the United Pentecostal Church there, and uh, someone in Kingston uh, had made arrangements. Ian Boyne uh, was a, a well-known uh, Christian talk show host. Uh, his program was known throughout Jamaica. And so through some connection with the church in Kingston, uh, we were given this invitation to participate. So this is another example of, I wasn't really seeking it, but at the recommendation of the UPC of Jamaica, they felt it would be worthwhile, it would be a positive introduction to our theology, it would be 
positive publicity. And so it was really styled as an interview. But of course, as it turned out, um, the host, although he was interviewing me for what we believed, he had very strong Trinitarian views of his own. So naturally he was asking questions that would push me in the opposite direction. But it was friendly. I, I, I didn't feel like he was trying to call us a cult or heretics. He was definitely thinking that we're incorrect and unorthodox in our theology, but he was wanting to hear my response. I think he felt he had some unanswerable questions, so he was wanting to ask those, and of course I feel like I was able to answer them. Uh, the, the viewer can decide for himself or herself, but all in all, I think it was a fair forum and a thorough forum in which to discuss the doctrine of the oneness of God. You presented your doctoral dissertation research in the Dean's Lecture Series at Urshan College, Urshan Graduate School of Theology in 2015. Um, so maybe you want to say something about that presentation. Yes. When I became uh, president of Urshan Graduate School of Theology in 2000, we opened the doors in 2001, I felt it was important for, my, for me to pursue my theological education. I'd actually started by going to Wesley Biblical Seminary and taking Greek, but in the course of time with everything else I was doing, starting a church, I just never pursued my master's degree in theology, although it was in the back of my mind as a potential goal. When we started UGST, I felt like I needed to pursue that. So I pursued my master's degree of theology and I pursued my doctorate. So the presentation there is essentially uh, summarizing the results of my doctoral thesis for the University of South Africa. Uh, what makes it a little interesting, and I think it all turned out for the best, the University of South Africa is, uh, uses the European model uh, for doctoral study, which means you don't uh, attend a certain number of classes, but basically you write a doctoral thesis and the professor builds an individualized curriculum of extensive reading and writing in various subjects, all leading towards your ultimate goal. So that was suitable for me uh, because I didn't have to actually go to a certain number of classes with my schedule that was really impossible. I chose South Africa, the University of South Africa, because it's the single largest uh, school in the world that uses this model, is well known, has a great reputation. And so my professor guided me through the whole process. Uh, of course, he had uh, no clue of who I was as he did know, not know what oneness Pentecostalism was, and he had no idea of any kind of involvement that I had. Of course, during my doctoral program, I was elected as general superintendent of the UPCI, which kind of slowed me down somewhat. It was a small time commitment. Uh, yes, it, it took, it was a little bit of a distraction there, but I still managed to persevere and finish. So my original thought was I wanted to write something related to oneness theology, but not in a polemic way, not as an advocate necessarily directly, um, not anti-Trinitarian certainly, but trying to contribute to biblical scholarship in such a way that it would enhance the goals or advance the goals of oneness Pentecostal theology. And so uh, it seemed that I was successful. My professor thought I did a great job in that, not knowing, with his not knowing any of the theological background, but just looking at it as a New Testament exercise, he thought it was good. So we submitted it as is their plan. They choose three confidential reviewers, at least one of whom has to be an international scholar in the field that you're writing in. And those three reviewers have to give back you know, their evaluation. Well, when I, when I submitted my manuscript and it was reviewed, one of the reviewers, whoever uh, it was, uh, took strong objection. But the objection was very strange because it said this person is the foremost polemicist for oneness Pentecostalism, and he should not be allowed to use his thesis to promote his doctrinal agenda. Well, I'd never mentioned oneness Pentecostalism, so the only way the reviewer would know me is if he already knew my name or maybe he Googled me or something. Of course, my professor, my supervisor, was totally befuddled. He said, either I'm totally misreading your thesis or this person is totally misreading your thesis because I didn't get 
uh, anything polemical or controversial. I just saw you're doing research. And he says, of course, every researcher has their own agenda. Even the person reviewing this has their own agenda. So I'm not sure why that's a problem. But in the end, what he told me is to, to overcome this, uh, what you, and so I had to explain what oneness Pentecostalism was, uh, that I'd written a number of books in the field, that I was a leader in the field, and this person probably was a conservative Christian that objected to my use of conservative Christian scholarship to not, not, to not go in the direction of the Trinity, but in a different direction. Uh, so for that reviewer, it was an unfair use of the material. So what my professor basically told me to do, you need to add a section on oneness Pentecostalism and saying this is going to be the basis from which you start your study. You still have to go through all the analysis, be as objective as possible, but postmodern hermeneutics says everybody starts somewhere. Instead of trying to pretend that you're a neutral, objective observer, you admit that here's where you start and then you proceed. So that way, your readers can evaluate for themselves how biased you might be or whether your logic is flawed, has, has it been unduly influenced by your skewed perspective. So they have all the information that you have, they can evaluate you based on who you really are. He says once you make that explicit, you still have to use scholarship, you still have to do exegesis, your, your scholarship still has to stand the test of, uh, of, of all criteria but this way, you, your view cannot be disallowed because you have a perspective. In fact, you can in turn argue, well, the oneness Pentecostal perspective has been underrepresented in scholarship. And since there are 30 million oneness believers around the world, you can't just dismiss this perspective out of hand. At least you have to engage it. And so actually, I had to write probably one third or more <laughs> added to the original manuscript, it did go back through the review process, and of course it was approved, but because of that process, which took me an extra year to write and an extra year to review, so at the time it was very painful, uh, especially since I didn't really have discretionary time. I mean, it wiped out a month of Christmas vacation one year, Thanksgiving and Christmas, to, just to try to get this done. But as it turned out, it now became cutting edge oneness Pentecostal scholarship. And because of that, it was chosen for, for the uh, Journal of Pentecostal Theology Supplement Series as the only example to date of oneness Pentecostal theology in that series. Probably it wouldn't have been chosen had I not been explicit about my Pentecostal background or even my oneness Pentecostal background. So I guess in the end, um, it became more thorough of trying to answer every conceivable objection because every conceivable objection was thrown at me. So I had to bolster it and, and my plan was not to use any oneness research to, to, to as, as my main uh, foundation or even to use my own personal uh, opinion, but for every major point I would use a recognized scholar who was often a Trinitarian scholar uh, but of course the conclusions were mine, but every point leading to that conclusion or every exegetical point, I was able to get respected scholarly support so that uh, while the end result was distinctively mine and would reflect oneness Pentecostal theology, every step of the way and every piece of evidence was separately attested and verified and backed up with scholarly research. So it really made my argument much stronger because it required me to bolster my argument uh, in, in many ways. And then, as I said, it ended up uh, enabling my thesis to be a, a distinctly Pentecostal theology, which um, in view of the size of the overall Pentecostal movement and the size of the oneness movement, uh, the scholarly community recognizes we need more research from this perspective. And, and so it you know, your doctoral thesis is supposed to make an original contribution to scholarship, so it ended up making an original contribution to Pentecostal scholarship. And it was reviewed in NUMA, and it actually got some very positive feedback. Yes, it was reviewed in NUMA, the, the Journal of the Society for Pentecostal Studies, which is the leading, really the only scholarly uh, association of Pentecostals. Um, I will say 
that I got some very favorable reviews. This is not to say the reviewers agreed with my conclusions or my theology, but they felt it was done in a credible way, scholarly way, and the arguments deserve to be considered and addressed, and maybe at least some of my points were valid. So without trying to claim that they're on my side, but um, Chris Thomas, who is uh, a leading theologian for the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, he actually edited the book because he's the editor for the Journal of Pentecostal Theology Supplement Series and had very positive comments. Frank Machia, who's a leading scholar in the Assemblies of God, he did the review in NUMA. And uh, of, of course, I've known both of these men for many years and we've interacted for years on a scholarly level. And so they know where I'm coming from. But uh, Frank Machia said that he would use it as one of his texts for a Christology class because he felt like uh, many of the points were valid, worthwhile, and, and the viewpoint needed to be considered by students who were studying Christology. Uh, and then Amos Young, who's perhaps the leading Pentecostal charismatic theologian today, writing in prolifically in many fields, uh, he also gave a very positive review, uh, which was included in the, on the back cover of the book. And then my own uh, professor, Gerhard Vandenhever, uh, from the University of South Africa, He's probably not uh, a Christian in a traditional or conservative sense, but he's a leading uh, scholar in early Greco-Roman uh, uh, literature or uh, religions, I guess you'd say. But he cited my work in some of his subsequent works, and he also wrote a very favorable review saying that, that my work would cause a reconsideration of the issues of Nicaea, uh, the Council of Nicaea. So, of course, that's uh, from our perspective, that, that's a great thing. If I can get people to reconsider Nicaea, um, that would certainly uh, be to our advantage. So all in all, yes, I think it has been well received. And of course, it was published by Deo, uh, which is a conservative, well, not conservative, but a scholarly uh, press in the United Kingdom uh, that specializes in uh, Pentecostal scholarship, but it's not limited to Pentecostal scholarship. I understand they've recently been bought by Brill, which is a major scholarly um, press, and so I presume that my book will be carried by Brill. Uh, of course, the easiest way to get it is through PentecostalPublishing.com. They do carry it. It's called the, uh, the Glory of God in the Face of Jesus Christ. It's written from a scholarly perspective, so it's a little tougher to read than some of your other books. Yes, I wouldn't advise you just to pick it up if you don't have a background of some kind in in theology. Uh, it wouldn't be your introductory work. My book, The Oneness of God, and its sequel, The Oneness View of Jesus Christ, would present uh, the doctrine of the oneness of God in terms for a general audience or even a general ministerial audience, whereas the glory of God in, Jesus, in the face of Jesus Christ is really more for a scholar uh, or someone who's willing to engage in the scholarship because many of the terms and concepts won't be familiar at first glance. Uh, it's a different language but the basic concepts are the same.